just so that you're aware of this, what we're doing tonight, the style that we're doing is what we normally did before. We didn't have a PowerPoint every week. I mean, I would have a PowerPoint maybe, what, maybe five times a year or something like that. If there was something on art or something else, it was very visual, I might, I might have a PowerPoint display. But otherwise, we basically had a conversation like this. Um, and so you should have received a handout with the link. With the link, there were two things that were part of that. One is the handout that everybody here is holding onto that they pick up when they come through the door. And the second thing was a link to a list of things to do on Zoom to make it more effective for you, okay? So you should have seen those two things. And if you downloaded the handout, then you have it. Otherwise, you can actually do a dual screen and look at the handout on screen while you're watching everyone here. Um, so this evening, I, I was going to start to talk about Arya and Arya as a Buddhist concept. And this might sound a bit strange for folks. Uh, but keep in mind that in the last year, this temple, as well as a number of other Buddhist temples, as well as um, Hindu temples and Jain temples, actually had a, a project because the state of New York Department of Education, uh, well, there was, uh, there was a bill in the New York State Assembly and, well, the legislature, Senate and Assembly, in which they were focusing on the use of the swastika as a symbol of hate. And of course, if you had attended some of the, what we had done more recently, you would have seen that the swastika is a symbol that's used in Buddhism and Hinduism and Jain um, for several millennia. And in the case of, of Arya, it's a similar situation. We see the term Aryan and it has today, we're, we have organizations such as, I don't know if they'd be, I guess they'd be called organizations, the Aryan Brotherhood, which are prominent in prisons. And then we have neo-Nazis who use Aryan as a, as a, a term to describe themselves as in a racial category, which Aryan is definitely not a racial category. But then you get into the whole thing of, well, there is really a human being, no such thing as race to begin with. So that's, that's a separate issue. Um, but Arya is prominent in Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain traditions. And so one of the things that we started doing, and by the way, the, the bill that was proposed, we ended up squashing. The work that we did ended up, the person who supported the bill ended up pulling the bill. And now we're working on reintroducing the bill as a hate, the hate bill, and this was going to be part of the education program, that certain symbols are hateful and should be uh, taught in the schools as as such, but doing it in such a way that the that that the swastika is then demonstrated to be a sacred symbol, and there's a difference between the swastika and the Hakenkreuz, which is the German term, which is crooked cross in German. It'd be rather like Christians um, looking at the Ku Klux Klan burning cross and everybody looking at the burning cross and say, all that's all Christians. You know, we recognize the burning cross as a as a as a hate symbol, obviously, but we don't associate the burning cross by the Ku Klux Klan with Christianity necessarily. I'm not saying the Ku Klux Klan doesn't associate with Christianity, don't get me wrong, but that that's a different issue. So that's sort of the, the reason that we're doing that. So we're, we're trying to restore the term Aria and Aryan um, instead of looking at, it, looking at the terms as being associated with Hitler and the Nazis and um, that whole period and currently with white supremacist groups and they're the ones who use the term uh, Aryan with white supremacist groups. We're hoping to restore the meaning of Aria. And so we, we do that by informing people, well, this is what it is. And so that if you're at the average person on the street and somebody said to you, Aria and Aria, what would you, what would you say? What would be a response? You wouldn't have a response? 
Yes, I guess so. And yes. what would it be? I'm a white person, yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, I and I think that, that the average person on the street, that would be their response. They associate Aryan with, with white. With white, yeah. yes, that's true, yes. Yeah. And so that there, it's associations. You you said you wouldn't agree, no, and what, because you had this before. No, because I would consider myself a Celt. Oh, a Celt. Okay, <laughs> that's my heritage. Right. Okay. Yeah, but aren't they Aryans? Well, it, no. well, the the, the direct <laughs> answer is no. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that a lot of Ari. I'm sure that a lot of Celts consider themselves Ari. Well, I'm Celt too, so. Oh, there it is. Well, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't isn't Aryan isn't Aryan the name that anthropologists gave for the people that moved into India from the north? That's the name that 19th century anthropologists gave. We now right. we now have a very different view of what actually happened there, and okay. as and as I'm going to say a little bit later. That idea was actually spread by uh, British colonialists. They're the ones who were making those, that type of statement or that, you know, that, and that was based upon some evidence that they had, but they were interpreting it in a particular way, put it that way, okay? But it was useful to the British colonial administration to create this notion of the Aryan invasion of Northern India. But we'll, we can we can talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. But, but these weren't Nordic blondes. I mean, it was a different kind of Aryan from the Nazi period, right? No, no. These were people that the the Aryan that the anthropologist. Well, here's here's sort of the the quick and, and dirty about that. The 19th century view was that the Aryans came from uh, Eastern Siberia, came down through Central Asia, from Central Asia, then dispersed in various directions. And it was based upon the fact that the, well, I, I shouldn't say the fact, it was based upon the perspective that the language that they had, which was identified as Indo-European, was the language that 19th century linguists, anthropologists, historians, etc., had felt was the original language for both what we think of as Sanskrit. In fact, the, the Aryan as you're see later actually did was the um, language that gave us Sanskrit and there is a relationship between Sanskrit and European languages and it may have actually been centered someplace in Central Asia but the way that it was being taught in the 19th century was that this was a racial group that came down and spread out and then the British pointed out that the Indians in northern India were light-skinned compared to the Dravidians who were in the south of India, which is true. I mean, the northern Indian people tend to be lighter-skinned and the people in the south tend to be darker-skinned. Um, however, they were using that as a quote-unquote proof of the Aryan conquering of India. There was no evidence that, in fact, there was a conquering at all. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. But, um, but the question I had was, when the Nazis started talking about the Aryan people, they were talking about Northern Europeans. So is there some connection between the uses of the term? The Nazis saw a connection between the people who came from Siberia and settled in uh, Central Asia. And then those people diffused, according to the Nazi theory, based upon a German anthropologist to the Northern climbs into Scandinavia, Northern Europe, et cetera. And so, in, well, we know that things are back to normal because Chip is 15 minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, that was where that idea came from, was that those Central Asians had gone up. And now, what, what makes it even more um, to, the, to the Germans in, in the 20th century, what made it more uh, attractive is that the term Aran or Ara means noble or superior, depending upon how it's translated and the usage for a particular sentence. 
So it's either no, it's either noble or superior, and that fit then within the Nazi paradigm. And so they grasped onto the idea that the Aryans, must, in order to be superior, remember, if you're a Northern European, you felt that you're superior to begin with. The Southern Europeans and the people who were not Northern Europeans and Western Europeans, I mean, even Eastern Europeans were considered to be inferior compared to Northwestern Europeans. And so they, they played upon that idea. Does that answer it? Yeah, I mean, just but just to close the loop, the Nazis never looked at uh, uh, the Indians of Northern India as being part of their Aryan Brotherhood, right? Oh, no, ab absolutely not. No. Okay. No. They would have been they would have been shocked. Got it. And, um, so going on there, it, 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 that's the association. So the several thousand year old meeting of Arya is integral to the Dharmic traditions. I'm just coming off the handout now. And the word Aryan originated as the Indo-Iranian speaking people, the term that they used to identify themselves around 2000 BCE. And it literally means noble one. Aryan means noble one. Interestingly enough, the country Iran is the Persian term Aryan. So the country Iran is actually, that's the Persian word for Aryan. Yeah, which I find really, really, I didn't know that until I began doing this, this, uh, this research. Um, so the etymology and diffusion of Aryan is the pro-European language and it's derived and we could go into that in more in more detail. No, 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 no. Sorry, now my dogs are barking at yeah. you. <laughs> myself. So meaning to the meta sangha. That's right. <laughs> the, meta, the meta sangha is is spreading. Um, and the fact of the matter is is this also, and I have to I have to put this in there that when we look at how that notion that, that um, uh, Maynard was bringing up, that notion of how the Nazis used, to, used the terms and all that um, to mean Northern Europeans. When I was doing your research, I found six separate, not just sources, groups of sources that had totally different stories of the Aryan people. And today, one of the issues, and you'll find this interesting, one of the issues in India, among Indian, meaning Indian subcontinent, Indian anthropologists and historians are denying that the Aryans ever came into northern India because they would maintain, the Hindu nationalists, that Sanskrit as a sacred language had to arise in India, not from outside of India. And further, they would argue that the Indian people, the Hindu nationalists today in India, the Hindu people are a pure people who are not part of anybody else, the immigrants that would have come in. So I think it's another example of how, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to use the term fascism, how fascism seems to model um, the same characteristics no matter where you where you go. And so I that that and so one of the things I saw I, I saw some Indian references sources and we're talking about in in legitimate archaeological and anthropological journals and I looked at it and I read it and I said to myself this is all just political poppycock this has no relationship to reality <clears throat> which I, I found really really rather interesting anyway so moving along. One of the things also, so the current, the current feeling is among, I, I would say the consensus of non-political anthropologists, historians, archaeologists, non-political meaning that they don't have an ax to grind in the discussion. Um, I think that the consensus is that the people that were referred to as Aryan came from Central Europe originally. Where did they come from before then? Your guess is as good as anybody else's. However, they probably were not an ethnic group, which is the way it's often characterized. That, that is the way it was characterized but in the 19th century. Uh, they probably were not an ethnic group. They probably represented different ethnic groups, but they shared a language. You know, think about the difference today between people who are English speaking. You've got Indians, you've got Americans, you've got British, you've got, you know, Australians, you've got Guyanese, et cetera. 
Uh, so they're sharing a language, but they don't share any, any genetics or anything like that. Um, but it was viewed that the people, that there probably was some kind of a climactic or ecological um, change in Central Asia during that time around 2000 years ago. And so the, they were nomadic herding people. Think about people that are rather like um, the Native Americans, you know, the Plains Indians. They were a, a people that were tribal, that had certain characteristics in common by virtue of the fact that they were nomadic. They, they herded cattle, they herded goats, sheep, et cetera, as well as transhumanists, meaning that they, they would herd um, animals that would be equivalent to bison, you know, in the same way that Native, Native Americans didn't really herd bison, but they followed the bison along their paths and that sort of thing. Anyway, that group of people that we could identify as Aryan came down into Northern India. And the, this was about the same time that other anthropologists, archaeologists inform us that the civilization that was there at the time, which was Dravidian primarily, that culture was beginning to collapse. And we see, and, and it may be due to the same sort of ecological collapse that the Aryan were ex experiencing to the north, maybe in part of that same, same process. But the Indus civilizations, two things were different about them. Number one, they were Bronze Age people. The Aryans were Iron Age people. Mm -hmm. So they could farm and they could exploit the environment in a better way than the Indus civilization was there. And the current thinking is that the Aryans replaced the Indian civilization, didn't displace this, that Indus civilization. In other words, they were absorbed into, and if you look at the genetics of the Dravidians today that exist in India, half of their genetic characteristics are Aryan, which mm -hmm. indicates that there was interbreeding of the populations. And so the Aryans at that time were better able to exploit the environment that they had moved into in, nor in Northern India, if that makes sense. Um, and, and so just going back to something I said before, the idea of the Aryan conquest was one of the things that the Third Reich grasped onto they were superior people. They were a warlike people. Of course, they could con conquer anyone they came up against. You know, is pretty obvious, right? <clears throat> so that was that was part of the theory. And the British, like I say, uh, they ran with that idea in the nineteenth century. So, any any questions before I move on to Arya in in Buddhism? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first. I'm, I'm looking at the screen and pointing over here. Yes. <laughs> uh, the British adopted that because it legitimized their own conquest. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, and they were sort of, they were attracted to the idea also that maybe the Aryan people were the original white folks. Remember, this was at the time in the 19th century that you had the finds of Neanderthals and people peoples like that that existed even before Homo sapiens. We didn't know what we, I mean, let's put it this way. Our understanding of, of evolution, hominid evolution, uh, if I, you know, I once had to teach, you know, as, as a biological anthropologist, I had to teach human paleontology, a course on human paleontology. I couldn't do it today. There's been so much between the time that I taught it and today that I would be, I mean, I, and I just haven't kept up with it. So, you know, that's just the reality of it. Um, yeah. So was like city like Harappa, was that? Uh... Harappa was a separate culture and they would have argued that that had been displaced also by the, or by the Aryans. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the Harappa, the Harappans, and there was the Mahodian. Yeah, yeah. There's there a number of cultures, and they were the theory from the 19th century. They were all displaced by the by the Aryans. That was the theory. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, <clears throat> so we see Arya in Buddhism. Now, here's one of the things that we do know: that the Vedic period was from around 1500 to 500 BCE. Notice that it ended with the advent of Buddhism and Jains. So the, the 
Vedic period, what is referred to as the Vedic period, really ended with the development of the Upanishads, which was right around 500 BCE. And <clears throat> it was those peoples who were the nom nomads that we're calling Aryan, not as, again, not as a racial or an ethnic group, but as a, a linguistic group, who actually wrote the data. Now, you can see why the Hindu nationalists would be upset about that. Mm -hmm. You had all these immigrants coming in and writing their sacred books, right? And so we know that the Aryan wrote the Veda, or actually they didn't write the Veda because we know that the Veda were oral, not written. Uh, it wasn't written down for several hundred years after 500 BCE. It was the, the writing of the both the Buddhist materials as well as the Vedas didn't begin until about 200 BCE. But... You, the Vedic period was from 1500 to about 500. And the end of the period, developed, you saw the development of the Shrama, of the Shramana, the Buddhists and the Jains. But, you know, we, we refer to Buddhists and Jains. Those are the traditions that are extant today. But there's, there were a handful of other traditions that were just as popular at that time. They just did not persist. And they developed in very similar ways. There's a, there's a few of them that are still the, uh, what's called the Advent, Advents, that are still in India, that do have some followers, but they don't have the, the widespread following that, that Buddhism and Jain has. And thus the Buddhism really adopted much of the Vedic um, tradition by virtue of using Sanskrit uh, incorporating many of the myths that the Buddha, that the, the Vedic traditions had, they incorporated them in various ways. We could that that's worthy of a of a session by itself. And but the sacred language that's uh, uh, Sanskrit. The word is defined variously Arya as noble or superior. And as I'm I'm going to quote, and this is from just the the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism, a term appropriated by Buddhists from early Indian culture to refer to its saints and used technically to denote a person who has directly perceived reality and become a noble one. In the fourfold path structure and main mainstream schools, an Arya is a person who has achieved at least the first level of sanctity, that is that of the stream enter or sotapanna. So. Stream enter means if one has taken refuge, or even if one is sitting and listening to this discussion, you're a stream enter. That, that's really what it means. It means being exposed to the Dharma at some level. Uh, that, that's all it means. Um, and so I, I provide some examples that are used in Buddhism uh, today to show you how widespread the term is. Let's see. The first term that, that you probably... Um, here in relation to noble is Kadvarya Arya Satyana, Satyani, excuse me. So Kadvari Arya Satyani. Literally, it's translated as the Four Noble Truths, but more accurately, it should be rendered the Four Truths known by the spiritually noble. Because the truths aren't noble, the people who follow them are noble. How many years have we been calling them the noble truth? Uh, noble since truth? the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> well, this oh. time, it's, um, we should we should have been well, you know. Well, I mean that puts a whole different. To say the four the four truths known by the spiritually noble. Yes, I know. Is not as euphonious. Yeah. You know, it's, it's but we've a, used the adjective to apply to the truth. Right, oh. but for all this time, you've been thinking, yeah. oh, the path is noble. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's those who follow the path that are noble, not the path itself. Mm -hmm. The path would be referred to in Shasana as um, the four truths, plain and simple. Um, <laughs> and so another way to understand this is it might be that there are four facts known to be true by those noble ones with the insight into the nature of reality, but not known by ordinary beings. And ordinary beings here means people who have not been exposed to it. That's what it means. It just means people who have not been exposed. Now, because in this, the way of looking at this, from the time of the of Nikaya Buddhas, they, do, they 
divided the people who followed the path into depending upon which period of time, which group of people between four, eight, or even 12 sets of individuals to how well do they understand the teachings. And, and the end would have been in Akaya Buddhism would have been the Arhat. You know, you've got the four are pretty simple. It's the stream enterer, the, um, what's the second one? The second one is let's say the stream enterer, then uh, the, then um, once returner, once returner, then the non returners, and then our odds. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, once we heard, yeah, uh, we'll be talking about that in just a moment. Um, and so another term, so that's the four, that's the four noble truths, or maybe from now on, we're going to say the four truths known by the spiritually noble, you know, that that's going to last for about one week. <laughs> I got to tell you right now. Okay. And so I can just see now giving refuge. Do you accept the four truths that are known by the spiritually noble? No. Then we have the Arya. Arya Bodhisattva. And this is interesting because you'll see that I included the Japanese for all these terms. And the reason, by the way, that I did that, it's a trick to help me. So that, you know, from years ago at Taisho Daigaku, I would come across these terms in Japanese. And at the time, I didn't have a convenient way of looking them up. And I just accepted them as they were. Um, and so I use this as an opportunity to write down the Sanskrit and the Japanese for terms that I had heard, but never had written down per se, because I didn't have a good definition at the time. Um, but the Arya Bodhisattva is an example of a term that's used in Tibetan Buddhism and in no other form of Buddhism. It's not used in Japanese or Korean Buddhism as an example. And a superior Bodhisattva is a bodhisattva, and, and it, it's really interesting because in Tibetan Buddhism, you'll see how it plays. In Tibetan Buddhism, when you talk about a superior bodhisattva, it is someone who is like the Karmapa, would be an example of an Arya bodhisattva, someone who is recognized as a superior bodhisattva, as opposed to the other <coughs> types of bodhisattvas. Now, a lama is still considered a bodhisattva just because he's entered the path, but someone like the Karmapa, the Dalai Lama, the um, number of others, they're individuals who are not only the head of a lineage, but are seen to have superior spiritual powers. Uh, okay. um, and then you've got the Arya Datu. And by the way, the Arya Datu in... Um, uh, Nikaya is the Arya Vamsa, so you'll hear you'll see it in several different ways. In the Mahayana, it's the Arya Datu, Datu. and the Arya Datu is the attitudes of the noble lineage. And there are four attitudes to the Nikaya Buddhists: contentment with robes, food means you accept what's given to you and you don't complain about it and beds and devotion to the way of liberation. Now, in the Mahayana, the attitudes take on different meanings, but I'm gonna discuss that a little bit later in the Dharma talk. And so I, I won't go into that right now. Now there's also Aryadeva, which is Daiba in Japanese. By the way, Job, I, I hope you appreciate that this, this is uh, um, helpful to you also, or at least theoretically it's helpful to you <laughs> also. Right, right, Joe? Yeah, I can see. Yeah. He's looking at me. No, I, I'm meditating. Nice. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I didn't hear you, Joe. No, I'm meditating. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but can I can I make a comment? It's so ironic, right? Because it's you're talking about the use of use and the misuse and the abuse of the word alien. But but the way in which the Nazis used is exactly the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. the, because all Aryans in the original sense, as you described, refer to the people who recognize goodness in the other. Ah, we, we, lost, we, we lost the end of what you said. Could you repeat that, Joe? The original sense of the word Aryans, or the Aryans as used in Buddhist literature, 
refer to the people who are able to recognize the goodness in the other. That's right. Whereas Nazis, they denied <laughs> the goodness of the other. <laughs> it's so a, it's totally it's a, the opposite. Right. It's not only they are wrong, misused, they use in the opposite sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, stop and think about the fact that we see the term freedom used and some of the ways the term freedom is used is exactly opposite of what we would consider freedom. So, you know, it's not, a, it, I, I don't think it's all that unusual. Um, we also have the term Arya Diva, which is, and he was a person, there are actually two people, there were, I, I only list the one, but there were two people who have the name Arya Diva. And one was an important proponent of the Majamaka uh, philosophy, and he was a disciple of Nagar, Nagarjuna, and his most famous work is the Katashataka, which is 400 verses. And it's, it's considered one of the um, essential verses of Majamaka. And there was another Ari Deva, which, which arrived, which we can read about, who came later, about 200 years later, I believe it was. Um, and he was also an, an individual who was very important. But they included the name Arya in their in their names, Arya and Diva, meaning one who is spiritually advanced. Uh, was the other Arya Deva a major translator? But, uh, no, it, it wasn't a tra he wasn't a translator. Oh. The other Arya Deva was not a translator. But th there were so there are two of them. But if they also be the, but the point I'm making is we know at least two people that accept that took that name. But there were probably many more. Ara was Arya was a a um, popular name to match with something else. So the noble whatever that was a very popular popular Dharma name. And then we have the Arya Grafala Shodoko. You know, I have to tell you, I, I, in a sense, I'm glad that Ichishima Sensei is not here, so I don't have to have this discussion with him. The Japanese pronunciation of things is so much easier than the Sanskrit pronunciation of things. <laughs> I mean, it's so much easier to say Shodaka as opposed to uh, Arya Magarfa, Agafala. And that refers to the old path and the fruit, the, super, the four super mundane paths and the four super mundane fruits that mark the attainment of sanctity. And what this is referring to are the Again, going back to the idea that we that we had earlier about um, the four the four the eight types or the four types, and this is referring specifically. Um, oh, I didn't go to uh, Arya Marga. I'll go there in a second. Um, we have these four or eight types that refer that refer to paths that were used by Nikaya Buddhists. The Arya Marga was the noble path the path of vision, path of cultivation, and of the adept who has nothing more to learn. Those are the four of the Arya Marga, which again is, you find it, you don't find it so much in Mahayana Buddhism, but it's, it's uh, a central feature of Theravada Buddhism today. And then there's Arya Sangha. Oh, I skipped another one, but we'll go back to that. And the Arya Sangha, as you can imagine, is the noble community or community of noble ones this originally referred to uh, the followers of Shakyamuni Buddha. And, you know, I was, I was reciting this and it said Shakyamana Buddha instead of Shakyamuni Buddha. But, you know, it's not on your sheet that way. It's on my sheet that way. So I made the change. Anyway, so there are eight types or grades of, again, different types of Sangha. And today, again, this refers to a community of anyone who has taken refuge. So the Arya Sangha is specifically, this grouping here constitutes an Arya Sangha. Um, Essentially noble community. A noble community. And then we have the Arya Puddhagala, like, which is Kenjo. Kenjo is much easier than Arya Puddhagala. An epithet given to enlightened beings, and there are, again, many gauges that are associated with that, and I'll skip that for the moment. Uh, and then something that we come across all the time, and again, it's the Noble Eightfold Path, and again, more correctly translated as the Eightfold Path of the Spiritually Noble. So stop calling it the, the, no, the Eightfold Noble Path. And keep in mind that that is the fourth of the 
four truths of the spiritually noble. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and it's also referred to as the fourth wheel of the Dharma, in which he establishes the middle way between extremes of asceticism and sensual indulgence. And like I like said before, again, it's not the four noble truths, like the four noble truths, it's not the path which is noble, but those who follow it. Okay. So you can see by the number of terms you, that, I, that use Arya, the word is central to the foundation of Buddhist teachings. And along with this, we should be careful to recognize that the term Aryan is not a racial type, and we disassociate those assertions that the Aryan people subjugated the Dravidians and other Indian peoples around the second millennium BCE. The use of the term Aryan reflects a name used by cattle herders who went into the Indus Valley, Indus Valley after what had been characterized as ecological or climatic changes of their home range in Central Asia. But it's unclear as to whether there was ever an ethnic group that could be identified as Aryan, Aryan, but it was surely a linguistic grouping. Okay, are there any other questions at this point? So does Arhat come, have its origins in Arya? No, it's a different, it's a different oh, route, okay. different route. But, that, but I, as a matter of fact, that's something I had to look up because I didn't know. So it's is, a different route. Would, is, would Ara Sensei's name be a different? No, because this is Arya. Arya, okay. Not Ara. And our and our sensei, that was his family name. Oh. Anyway, any other questions? What about on the Zoom? Any questions over there? No questions? No. no. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the Dharma talk right now. Okay. So you can you can stick around for that. Okay. So currently I'm reading several books, and as usual, these books are both fiction and nonfiction as well as Buddhist Sutra and commentary. I list Buddhist literature separately because some of it may be fiction and some of it nonfiction. And I'll be discussing that next month with a discussion that titled Buddhist Literature Smashing Delusions. This evening's topic at our, on Arya and Aryan made me think about this. The word Arya meaning noble one who is on the Buddhist path speaks about the person who is journeying to find the nature reality too. All, too often, we think about this reality as found strictly through the tremendous practices that Buddhism has to offer, and these practices are essential. But from my perspective, we need a context of the teachings, and this ties in with the, the, the term Arya Noble. The nonfiction books I'm reading include a reread of White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism, by Robin D'Angelo. And this book is the topic of the discussion in an anti-racism forum. And it is about exactly what the title describes. Another nonfiction book is Happiness is the Wrong Metric, a liberal communitarian response to populism by the sociologist Amitai Etazioni. His writings argue for a carefully crafted balance between individual rights and social responsibilities between autonomy and order in social structure. Among the fiction are two books by two very good friends. Some people in Eastern New York and the Berkshires may know them or know of them. They're both members of the Rad Pack, of which I'm a member, and a small with a small group of colleagues um, who are current or retired professors of Bard College of Simon Rock, from which I retired a number of years ago. If this seems like a shameful plug, it is. I'm pushing these two books, and one is called Tragic Magic, and I'll be discussing in a moment, by Wesley Brown. And the other is The Bridge Tower Sonata, which is by Emmanuel Dalangala. <clears throat> so it is a plug. Buy the books, read the books, you know, and they're, they're good friends. So the first, the Bridgewater Sonata, Bridge Tower Sonata, or also called Sonata Malitaka by Emmanuel Nagala. Emmanuel is a, a, a Congolese chemist and novelist who taught chemistry and French literature at Simon's Rock and he retired in 2014. Uh, Koshin, do you remember Emmanuel? Yeah. Um, it was written in French because that's, he's a Francophone, so he writes in French. 
And it was one of the books that was at the top of the French um, most read list uh, for, for quite a while. Um, like I say, it was written in French and just this last April, two months ago, it was published in the States in, in English. It's a satirical novel on the life and times of the historical figure G George Bridgewater, who was a black violin prodigy and was born at the end of the 18th century and became a very close friend of Ludwig von Beethoven. And as a matter of fact, one of the Beethoven sonatas was actually written by, by Bridgewater. The story is about race, class, privilege, and humor and the rampant hypocrisy of that time, interestingly enough, mirrors our time in some very interesting ways. This was at the end of the 18th century. The second novel is Tragic Magic by Wesley Brown. And this book was originally published in 1978 and was republished as book one of a new diaspora series. The story is about a black 20 something ex-college radical who was just released from prison as a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. And this is a loosely written autobiography about Wesley, who was a member of the Black Panthers in the 1970s and was one of the only Black Panthers who actually spent time in jail. And it was for conscientious objection. In addition, I'm reading several other fiction and nonfiction, such as one by Donna Leone, who pens police procedures in the character of a Venetian Commissario Brunetti and rereading Embracing Defeat, Japan in the Wake of World War II by John Dower. The Buddhist works include our Tuesday tutorial where we are carefully going over Chigi's Makachitan, translated by Swanson, and of course, Ichishima senseis and other translators, editions of the Shoshikan. This in turn has led me to pouring over Nagarjuna's 12 Gate Treatise, translated in introductory essays, comments and notes by Tzu Li Cheng. And there's a, a, a new translation which came out recently, and I'm still waiting to, to get my hands on it. Because the one by, by uh, Su, Su Li is a really good translation, but it's sort of hard to follow for technical reasons. I won't go into it now. Why have I gone into such detail in my current readings? The nature reality exists in several perspectives that exist simultaneously. There is a reality beyond this, but from a middle way context, the only way to discover it is to abandon a narrow perspective and seek out what we don't know rather than seeking to affirm what we think we know. Let me rephrase that. The middle way context is to discover, in order to discover reality, is to abandon the narrow perspective and seek out what we don't know rather than seeking to affirm what we think we know. As a white male in the beginning of the 21st century, I'm reading material that's outside of my comfort zone, or at least outside my normal frame of reference. This is, was inspired by the term aria, noble. BQ Bodhi describes the Aryans as noble ones, the spiritual elite, who obtained the status not from birth, social station, or ecclesiastical authority, but from their inward nobility of character. This describes the result of Shugyo in Tendai. As a Theravada monk, Bhikshu Bodhi may see things differently as a way of attaining the status of the noble one. But as a Tendai Suryo, this attitude combined with practices is a path worthy of my time and effort. And so I would ask you if you would do the same. Abandon what you think you know and really examine carefully, not things to affirm yourself, but to expand what you know. And that is the path of the Arya, the noble one. Thank you.